Good afternoon, everybody. Happy, happy Saturday. I'm the Financial Rebel. Today is Saturday, and this is our special edition of the Financial Rebel Show called Our Saturday Super Conversations. Today, I have the opportunity and privilege to sit and talk with Jasmine Omar Rogue Bay. Did I get it right? Yes, you did. All right. Um, Jasmine is like a super duper, what I call a super duper taskmaster, but actually she's very, very knowledgeable. She's an academic professor, and now she works in a tech space for a big company who I won't give the name out to because I want to protect her anonymity, even though we are broadcasting on Facebook and YouTube. But Jasmine is also a uh, career coach and helps a lot of people write resumes and get ready to go into the workforce. And so today, since everybody is kind of up in a panic, not kind of, since everybody has been kind of panicking and thinking about what are they going to do for money? I noticed a lot of people are not talking about getting jobs or getting a new career or transitioning to a new career because what we have going on right now with the current crisis, a lot of people have a lot of time to think and a lot of people are starting to assess what's really important to them. And oddly enough, lots of folks are realizing that they could do something different that might be more in line with their passions, their strengths, their God-given abilities. And so I wanted to have Jasmine on the day to help people kind of realign themselves as they get out there and do their job searches and talk about what's needed with resumes. And now's the time to do it, even though a lot of us are not thinking about switching careers or switching jobs. However, in a time of crisis, that is always a time to reposition yourself. Now, housekeeping note, I look kind of blue. I, I, I didn't become an alien or an animated figure or whatever it is. For some reason, my computer has been giving me quite a hard time. So I think I'm going to have to go out and get a new laptop today if I can do that. Um, but I just want to let everybody know I didn't change my skin color. I'm not uh, doing reverse skin bleaching or any of that. Uh, it's a technical difficulty and I couldn't get through it. But I said I thought Jazz would have a lot of value to deliver. So I said, I'll look blue for today. So you can call me Kamari Smurf um, and we'll just proceed on with the conversation. So hello, Jasmine. Tell everybody a little bit about yourself. Well, thank you for having me, Kamari, the blue Smurf. Um, I am Jasmine Omarogbe. I am originally from Minneapolis, Minnesota. I currently have been living in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania for almost the last three years. And in terms of my background, I have always believed in helping to uplift and inspire others. The vehicles that I use to do that are both education and career. So I worked in higher education, meaning colleges and universities, for about the past uh, almost 10 years. And I've been doing career coaching for about 13 years. So I started out in the career center at the University of Minnesota, doing resume critiques, workshops, all those sorts of things. And then people have come to know me for those things. And I've been doing resume, cover letters, editing folks' work, helping people get into undergrad and get into grad school ever since. So I'm really passionate about helping people put their best foot forward, especially those in my communities who already have a bunch of barriers against them in the job search. I wanna make sure that having a typo or, or not having the right thing on your resume isn't the reason that people throw, throw them to the side and that we're able to elevate ourselves through our jobs and through education. Now, what, what fuels this passion to help people? especially with job searches? Sure. So ever since I was young, um, I'm an only child and both my mother and my father um, have always been committed to the community in different ways. My father is a corporate lawyer, but he also has a scholarship in his name. He's always at the galas, at the fundraisers. He's done a lot of community work. My mother has always done direct service. So helping people who've just come out of prison or helping people who are kind of down on their luck in life for a number of reasons. And so I grew up seeing my dad in the corporate space seeing my mother kind of on the ground on the front lines and they were both helping others all the time. And so I have sought out education so that I could do the same in my own way, which for me is helping people again with that education or that career. So I think to whom much is given, much is required. And I've been given a lot. I'm really thankful for all of that. And so this is my way of giving back um, to folks in my community and beyond. So you're basically modeling mommy and daddy's behavior. Uh, to some extent, yeah, I think it's not possible to not do that. But uh, in my own way, I've well, been some people to turn. Do some people turn. Way. You know, they do a one eighty and they totally run away from it. So I get no. it. That's great. That's great. 
Okay, so you help people with resumes. You mentioned if you don't want somebody to get turned away if they have a typo. Now, how often do you see typos in resumes and in cover letters? All of the time. I have people, master's degrees, doctor degrees. I'm I'm looking at resumes, hundreds of resumes from all over, people of all walks of life. And sometimes people say, oh, I had eight different people review this. And then I look and I'm like, oh, your hyphens are misplaced. Oh, you have a space that's not right. Oh, you have a typo there. Sometimes also people will heavily rely on spell check. And spell check will just tell you if a word is correct. It doesn't necessarily tell you if you're using it in the correct way. So sometimes people are just kind of making common mistakes that, you know, your eyes might glaze over if you've looked at your resume a dozen times, but it's always worth it to have other people take a look at it. Right, right, right. No, I, I, I do the same thing all the time. So <laughs> I totally get that. Now, in, in the advent of technology and everything that's going on, do resumes still matter? I mean, are people really reading through resumes or they put them into a scanner? Um, what's more important? Is a resume more important or is a cover letter more important? So those are great questions. And I know today we're talking about elevating your job search. So the first way I wanna I wanna cover is about refreshing your materials, but the second one was really about refreshing your strategy. So to your question, cover letters have always been important. Like it's something that you should do. It's not something that's gonna get you your job the job alone. But a resume with the cover letter is kind of a, a big bonus because the resume kind of states what you did. The cover letter can help put that in context and help give a little color to it. Your passion can come through. The reason why you're different from other people with that same level of skill will come through in a cover letter. So I always recommend, if possible, that people will do cover letters. Um, I will say, though, that if you're just sending resumes and just sending cover, cover letters out blindly, right now you're doing it wrong. Because the way that people leave jobs, for better or for worse, is honestly through connections, through networking, through having informational interviews with people who work at that company already, right? Because we know, just like the same way how we put our family members on, if you got something good, you wanna bring your friends and family along, people do that in jobs all the time. So if they have a candidate who they don't know versus someone who is somebody's brother, uncle, they used to work together, they're gonna bring that person on. So you really have to be creative and strategic about how you, yes, have your materials be A1, but then how you also go around that and you connect with the recruiter on LinkedIn or you do informational interviews with the hiring manager or other people who work at that organization on the side. You have to now, kind of- on a second. You, you, use, you use this phrase twice, informational interviews. Can you explain to everybody what an informational interview is? I would love to. Informational interviews are extremely powerful as a part of the job search. And what an informational interview is, it's usually, I say to start them at 20 minutes, but it's the connection that you make with someone who is where you want to be, right? So it is, a time for you to ask questions, to ask how they got to where they get, where they got to where they are. You can ask for advice, guidance. You can also, what's most important is at the end of that time, right? Let's say I want to, I want to be a finance rebel. So I say, hey, Kamari, how did you become a finance rebel? Where are you from? What's your story? Do you have any tips for somebody who wants to become a finance rebel? But the key question at the end of that informational interview is I say, hey, Kamari, do you have anyone else who you might want to connect me with? And now I have goodwill put in with Kamari because I, everyone loves to share their story. Everyone loves to feel like they're giving back. So Kamari now has a positive impression of me, but now I can connect with Kamari's network. And then I can say, hey, can I just send you my resume? So if you see anything, you'll keep me in mind. And now hopefully the next time Kamari sees something or hears of something, I'll be on his mind and he'll slide me that information and, and give a good word for me. So it's really a way to build connection, to gain more information. If someone wants to transition careers, it's a good way to find out, well, what do you do on a day-to-day -day basis? So it's basically a switch on the job interview. It's you interviewing someone else. And the purpose is not to get a job or not to you know, have them find you a job. It's really to make connections and understand more about the industry that you're looking to get into. Now, how do you go about getting an informational interview? So there are multiple ways. The first way I always recommend is for people to start with who you know. Think about your family members. Think about your friends. Um, I've moved about five different times to five different cities. Every time I go on Facebook and I say, hey, friends, I'm working on a project. I need to know people who work in education in North Carolina. Who do y'all know? And people will say, oh, my cousin's my mother. Or oh, I, work, I used to work with somebody who works in North Carolina. And then I follow up on those connections. I message that person to say, hey, I got your name from this person. I'm looking to move. Can you help me with this? And a lot of times, I know people can be afraid to ask, but it, it's really a situation where closed mouths don't get fed. So you can start with who you know, reach out to those folks. If you don't know anybody who's at a company you want to be in or in an industry or position you want to be in, LinkedIn is my next 
my next referral. I would say go to LinkedIn.com, find those companies, follow those companies, see who in those organizations are making moves. And it's really just a quick email. And there are templates online. I also have a book I can recommend um, that helped me, but it's really just, hey, here's who I am. I'm wondering if you'd have 20 minutes to talk to me about what you do or how do I how I can get into that field. And usually people will respond positively, right? And they may say, well, I can't do it right now, but give me two weeks or check back in with me in a month. Or they say no. And the worst is that you spent 30 seconds writing an email that someone said no to. But if they say yes, the results can be exponential. So it's worth shooting a shot to anyone who you can. Gotcha. Um, so going back to LinkedIn, LinkedIn, if you see somebody that's a connection of yours that works at the company that you're interested in, would you start with them first and ask them for the informational interview or ask yeah. them to connect you with someone to uh, help facilitate an informational interview? So with LinkedIn, and I think with any relationship, you have to be very strategic because you don't want the first time you're, you're talking to somebody to be like, hey, can you give me this? Can you help me with this? Right. So if you have connections on LinkedIn that you know you you want to that can be beneficial to you in the future, you should be checking in with those folks regularly so that when you do want to say, hey, I saw that you know XYZ person at this company, can you connect me? It shouldn't be your first time ever chatting with them. So right. you want to build relationships, check in, you know, follow their activity on LinkedIn, check in all the time. But let's say you haven't done that and for whatever reason, you want to connect with somebody who one of your connections is connected to. Yes, go ahead and reach out and say, hey, here's what I'm trying to do. I'm wondering if you can connect me with, um, Bobby Johnson, because I'd really like to talk to him for maybe 20 minutes just to find out what's going on. And hopefully you build up enough, enough good karma, enough goodwill in life that that person is willing to help you. But always start with who you know. You don't have to do an informational interview with that person if you don't think they have any value to offer. But it might not hurt to say, hey, can we jump on the phone for five minutes, 10 minutes? I want to let you know what I've got going on. And maybe you know somebody who can help me. And then maybe they would take the initiative of their own to connect you with that person. So it's all about kind of strategically building those relationships and trying to balance the ask and the give. And another point that I didn't mention earlier about informational interviews, when I do them with people, I might send them a $10 Starbucks gift card after. I'm always gonna follow up with an email that says, hey, thanks for your 20 minutes of time. Like I really appreciate it. You always wanna be gracious. You always, I always offer to be a resource because I don't wanna just be going around in life like taking, taking, taking. What can I give? I'll either pay it forward to someone else or if that person ever needs anything, they got me right because they took the time to chat with me they took the time to work with me so it's about giving and um receiving at the same time so that's like pay to play no <laughs> i'm joking like i'm joking i'm joking i'm joking <laughs> no but that's good but let's go back to the original question i asked you about the use of technology and how resumes are scanned and mm -hmm. you know i asked our resumes still relevant because it gets scanned a lot of times so you know, are you automatically kind of put to the side if you don't meet the checkbox or have a certain number of keyword searches? Because resumes use keywords now or resume scanners use keywords now. So, you know, how does that all factor in? Yeah. So a lot of companies are using scanners and you do have to have the keywords. I, I would recommend going through the job description and taking a look at where you can insert those things into your resume and cover letter. But I will say it depends on the size of the organization. So if you go to a Target, for example, yes, they have the funds to have a system that scans. If you're going to the mom and pop shop or a mid-sized company, they may have real life people who are scanning and reading your PDF with their own two eyes because they can't afford, they don't have the infrastructure to have that kind of technology. So I think you have to prepare your resume in a way that allows for both, whether it's just a, a recruiter who's spending 10 seconds looking at it or it's being scanned by a computer, you want to make sure that you're fine in both camps. Mm, gotcha, 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 gotcha. Now, are there any metrics to determine, let's say, the, the chances of getting a job? Like, and when I say job, right, I'm, I'm talking more fifty thousand dollars and above right um versus not having a, a resume right so if you have no resume let's say you have a connection to someone like you say use your connections do you always need a resume if you if you know someone or versus not knowing someone if that makes sense mm -hmm, i got you i think it's always worth it. You can create a resume in two to three hours. So I think having a resume, you mentioned no resume at all. I don't think anybody should not have a resume at all because whether or not you have a job right now, you're going to need a job in the future and you're going to need to keep track of what you've been doing. So one thing I recommend is a master or a lifetime resume so that you put on every committee you've been on, every community thing you've done, every job. Uh, yeah, you've had. 
Huh? I haven't I haven't updated my resume in I don't know how long, right? So what is a master resume and what is a lifetime resume? Sure. Okay. Sorry, so sorry. Like a CV? Um, no. Well, so CVs are used in academic spaces and they usually include presentations, publications. So the average person who's outside of academia does not need a CV, but what a, a master or a lifetime resume, those terms are interchangeable. And it's basically a collection of everything that you have done, period. So that you don't forget. So I have had one. My father had me create one in eighth grade. So I have one master document that has everything I have done from eighth grade, every uh -oh. step forward, everything collected till right now. So that way, if I if I'm applying for a job, you always want to do a new uh, update your resume for the job. And let's say I'm applying for a retail job. Well, now I know. Okay, in college I had a retail job for three months. Uh, I had another retail job. Like you don't have to now kind of rack your brain and start creating bullets. Or descriptions for that job you can just go and copy and paste from your lifetime or your master resume so it's just a running document that you keep updated so right now i have a great job i love my job i'm not looking but i make sure that my lifetime resume has hey i did an interview today with kamari kamari ellis so in case i need to jump and tell somebody that i need to add it really quickly i just copy and paste it now to this new version of a one-page resume that i have nobody cares that you talk to me <laughs> who cares that's going on my media resume that's a whole another separate resume Right. No, that's cool. I get it. I get it. I get it. Um, how long should a resume typically be? I recommend I say one page if possible, right? But two pages max. It's usually about one page per 10 years of experience. Now, the reason why people kind of get caught up in that is because they're trying to submit a lifetime resume to a job. They want to say, here is everything I've ever done. Jobs don't care. What you should be submitting right. is the most relevant experience that you have to that job. And I would usually try to go with stay between five to 10 percent. I mean, excuse me, five to 10 years back. We don't really need to see what you did 20 years ago. I don't put my eighth grade stuff on my current today resumes. I should be doing enough stuff that in the past five years, it's so impressive that they can go off of that. So I would say two pages is a good length. But when you have your two pages, you want to be strategic about what you're putting on there. You don't have to put every single job you have. And I know that there are a lot of memes that talk about how a job will ask you your employment history. When did you start? When did you end? And then you do all that and then they ask you for a resume. Well, the reason right. why is because your resume is not your employment history. Those are two different things. So your Say resume is the Say most- A lot of people don't know that. Well, let, let, I'm here to tell you, right? Your resume should just be a compilation of the most important, your most impressive things. And that may not be jobs that happened in order. Right. You may have some gaps in between there. So you title that section relevant professional experience. And that way they're not saying, oh, where did you work for these two years? You're like, oh, I was working at the dollar store. Like I didn't have I didn't have to put that on my resume. You don't have to put every job you have on your resume. Put the things that the employer is going to care about and that puts you in the best light. And that's how you really get to two pages. Gotcha. 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 Now, I just want to take a quick minute to say hello to everybody who's here. Um, Edith Richards. Thank you, ma'am. I know I missed you last Wednesday. I will be back this coming Wednesday for Wealthy Wednesdays, our weekly Q&A. Uh, Netergo, Mike, how are you? Thank you uh, for joining us. Everybody, go like and follow Netergo, Black-owned business. They make their own products, their own uh, cosmetic and beauty products. Um, very dope. I buy from Mike. I'm not going to say often, but a lot. He just got me for some money not too long ago. And he makes dope stuff. Mm -hmm. How are you? How are you? Maddox12, how are you? All right, Imani B, you're loving this. Thank you, Imani. That's my girl. <laughs> That's your girl. Oh, she's the ringer. <laughs> okay, click it. Yes, there is a like button. So, all right, we're going to save questions to the end. Everybody will come back to them. Um, I just want to take a minute and say hello to everybody. Uh, hello, Leah. I'm, I hope I'm saying your name right. Aaliyah, she's my girl, too. <laughs> oh, you got all the ringers in here. Okay. What's up, family? Don't mind me. I'm just the, uh, the black blue Smurf today. <laughs> um, <laughs> so if you're just joining, I'm Kamari Ellis. This is the Finance Rebel Show. This is our Saturday edition. I wanted to have to start doing some uh, interviews with some people that offer great value to our community for people who need help. And right now is one of those times a lot of people are worried. A lot of people are stranded home, not sure what to do. And I said, hey, maybe now's the time to think about what career path you want to go down and how to position yourself with everything that's going on. Um, it's always a great time to look 
especially in like times like these, because believe it or not, there's a lot of layoffs right now. We just got notice that another 4.4 million people were laid off last week. They gave us that notice on Thursday. So now we're up to 26 million people unemployed. But guess what? It's not going to stay like that forever. Um, when the states start to open back up, which they're already starting, which I think is a bad idea, by the way. However, there's going to be opportunities um, for work and job situations and career situations as they come about. And also one of the things that has shifted is people are doing more Zoom meetings and things like that. So now is a great time to do like Jasmine was just talking about and do some informational interviews. And you can do them on your, your laptop, your iPhone or your Android or your iPad. So, you know, there's some real things that you can really implement today uh, to take action with. So I just wanted to highlight those. So Jasmine, you were saying everybody should have a resume. You're basically saying I'm a slacker because I don't have a resume. I'm cool with that. I, I, I see the side eyes. I see him. I see him. I'm, I'm cool with that. I admit to my shortcomings. I can't do it all, right? Mm -hmm. I know I can be pretty amazing, but you know, I suck at some things. A resume will be one of them. So you said my resume should be any longer than two pages long. Even though I'm an older person, right? I'm over 40. I should still have two pages. So here's a question. Is ageism really real in the job market? Absolutely. 100%. This is the first time in history where we have had five generations alive and working in the workplace. So you have everyone from your traditionalist, folks who were born long ago, you have now Gen Z, right? So you have folks who are 18, 17 entering into the job search and their resumes are being looked at by people who are 60, 65 going their way out. Right. And then you also have like for you, for example, you're applying and you could have a 20 year old looking at your resume and 20 year olds. I'm going to tell you, our attention span over the generations has gotten less and less and less. So when they get a recruiter is going to look at your resume for 10 seconds, they're not scanning through pages and pages and pages of resumes. They want to say, hey, what did you do? Boom. Let me see it. Or if not, you're, you're to the no pile because I don't have time to sort through and parse through to see what's important. That's why you want to have the most important things at the top of your resume, catch people's attention and make them want to keep reading. But again, there are strategic ways that you can make sure your resume is written so that it's impactful. So even if you have 40 years of experience, you can still have a one page resume that highlights those things and makes them want to talk to you. You want to get to the interview level where your personality, your experience, your background, all that comes through on the interview. The resume is just to get your foot in the door, just to make them want to talk to you over somebody else. And so since ageism is real and a lot of folks my age and older don't like technology, from what I understand, technology can be a great way to, I guess, catch the attention of the potential resume reader. So should folks, you know, be looking at innovative ways like maybe a uh, portfolio online that you can send instead of a resume or some kind of video, a quick video intro instead of a paper resume? Or should you do all of the above? All of the above. So online portfolios are great. Some careers or some industries require online portfolios. Teachers, for example, have to have a portfolio and they also have to have a resume. So anything that you can create that's digital is going to speak for you. So I recommend people take their address off of their resumes and put their LinkedIn. Or if you have a portfolio, put that because as soon as somebody gets your name, especially if they're in those younger generations, as soon as they see your name on your resume, the first thing they're going to do is Google you. And because that's what they're going to do, whether you like it or not, you need to make sure that the first results, you can control those. You can create how you're perceived on the Internet. So the first couple links should be great. This is an article. This is something I wrote. This is my portfolio. This is my website. And I understand that there are generational gaps that make those things sometimes seem scary or intimidating. But you better ask your little cousin, ask somebody else to help you pay somebody, pay a consultant to make sure that your online presence, when somebody Googles you, you, do, you A, you don't want negative information or too personal of information, but B, you don't want nothing either. You should have something out there. And if something's going to be out there, you should control that message and make sure that it speaks for you the best that it can. Mm -hmm. OK. OK. So, you know, again, old people like me, you know, that's uh -huh. what folks like to say. I can go to like a Fiverr, maybe and get somebody to help me in terms of the digital asset piece. Yeah, you can go to Fiverr. 
Yeah, Fiverr, you can look for people who are doing internships. People, a lot of the folks are studying marketing or digital branding or those sorts of things. So again, I would start with your network and put on Facebook, put on Instagram, put call your friends, old school, mail a letter, say, hey, does anybody know somebody who can help me You know, work on my digital brand? Who can help me build an online portfolio? But if not, Fiverr, LinkedIn, you know, there's tons of companies. Just Google, you know, um, update my digital brand near me and see what comes up. Right. There are tons of people who work on this all the time. And if you have some money to pay or you're willing to invest in yourself to have someone help you, it's definitely worth it. So, again, folks should think about their resume or job hunting, not just from the perspective of having a resume, but it's also thinking about it from the perspective of having a digital brand. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, and, And those are, I think, if you're talking about somebody who doesn't have a lot of time or who has limited technology capacity, Start with the resume. You have to have, you can't do anything like just, you can't do anything without a resume. Start with having a solid resume because no matter how many tricks people want to put color, people want to put pictures, people want to do all that stuff on a resume, it doesn't matter. Like a lot of industries are looking for the conservative, black, white, tell me what you did. So as long as you have a resume written in a way that is impactful, it's organized, people can understand what you did. You don't necessarily have to do the portfolio and have to do the website because the resume is going to speak for itself. Those are just additions. Or if you're good at those things, add them because they're just going to speak louder and louder for you. But step one, good resume. Gotcha. 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 Makes sense. Make a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. All right. So it's we've been talking a lot about the kind of mid-season professional. What about the brand new, brand new person, either out of school or maybe they've worked a couple of odd jobs, but don't have a whole lot of solid experience or perceived Mm -hmm. experience, what would you do for them? So I think it all starts out with self-reflection. So whether you have one job, you have three jobs, there are jobs that are professional in your mind or not, what you need to do is get to the root. So I say, okay, I'm just graduating from high school. What have I done? And that's where that lifetime resume comes into play. If you worked at McDonald's, if you worked at the dollar store, okay, at the McDonald's, what do I do? I do customer service, I work with the team, I keep things clean so that customers are attracted to that space. And then you you use you write that down and write down what skills you're using. I'm using my interpersonal communication skills to talk to people. I'm using my uh, marketing skills to make sure the floor is clean and attract people in. Or when I talk talk to people, whatever those skills are. And then so you, you should building. say, "I'm working on fries right now. Hopefully, <laughs> I'll become an assistant manager in six months." Listen, put your goals out there. That's an objective statement that you just said. That can be your objective. That can be your cover letter. I don't really believe in having objective statements. But if you're new, you can have an objective that says, hey, I want to be an assistant manager. Right now, I'm working the fries, which means I'm timing the grease. I'm using my critical thinking skills to not burn myself, whatever those things are. So start where you are, and then you can start to build up your resume. And it also, doing that assessment of what you're currently doing and what your skills are, that's going to help you see the gaps. Like, okay, I'm really good at fries, but I need to know how to cook burgers. Let me go find somebody who can teach me how to cook a burger, right? And now you have identified a skills gap. You can identify where to go to fill that gap so that by this time next year, when you're assessing your skills, you say, okay, now I know fries, burgers, and chicken. I just need to know salad. Now I go find the salad skills. So for, for, for that example, I'm sure you get the point of it's important to assess where you are, start to categorize those things, start, start a resume, start a Word document somewhere on your phone in the notes app. Start to write down, hey, here's what I've been doing. And think about what do I want to be doing? What am I most happy doing? What energizes me? And what skills do I need to get there? And especially in Corona times, you have LinkedIn, you have Coursera, you have a lot of colleges and universities. They are offering free courses, Audible even, if you want to listen to audiobooks. They're offering free trials, longer extended trials than normal. You can go learn those skills right now for free. Or you can decide who to connect with on LinkedIn or who to connect with in your real life to help you build those skills. But that's stuff that you can be doing right now. But it starts with that self-reflection. Now, uh, staying with the younger generation, right? Many of them only want to work jobs that they're passionate about. So how does how does a person reflect the passion that they have for a particular skill, industry, or job in their resume? Mm-hmm. So, well, on that thought, I think that that's a generational difference right there. Mm-hmm. So sometimes you're hard on that one. Well, because you're older, you know, you know about the generations. Um, <laughs> older folks in the past have not necessarily. Listen, I had am older than Gen Xer. I'm not that old. Uh huh. Older folks in the past have not had the luxury of saying, "Oh, let me find my passion." 
let me find something I love to do, right? Because of financial circumstances, because of all the racism, classism, the patriarchy, everything, all the isms in the world, they have had to do the job that they could get at that time, right? right. So I think sometimes there's a, a misunderstanding or a disconnect between the generations because younger people are like, hey, I'm not going to do it unless I love it. And older people are like, does it make money? You should go do it. Like, we don't care about what you want to do, what you like to do. So I think there's some way. To to pay. What'd you say? We got bills to pay. Well, true, right? So there's some kind of happy medium in that the first job that you're getting, the second, third job may not be your perfect job. It may not be exactly what you're passionate about, but there are ways to create stepping stones to say, hey, I can, I don't really want to do this, but it's going to teach me this. And I can do that in my dream job. So I think that you have to get there, but it's all about kind of understanding. I think about when I think about like what I want to do, I think about what am I good at? What do I like doing? And what's going to make me money? So if you think about three different, I like to do a, a Venn diagram that people have probably seen online. It's not an original idea. But if I make a circle and I write in here, what things do I enjoy? Okay, I enjoy connecting with people. I enjoy dancing. I enjoy music. Now, what am I good at? I'm good at writing. I'm good at public speaking. Now, what's going to make me money? Because I like to dance, That does. it's not going to make me money in the career path that I seek. Right? It's just a hobby. It's something I enjoy. I'm good at it. I'm not, I'm not going to do it professionally. So what things are in all three of those categories that you're good at, you like, and can make you money? And I think those, that's where you start to envision your dream job or your goals of where you want to head because you want to be able to do all three. You can't always do all three. Sometimes you have to take a job below what you want because it's going to give you experience that will then leapfrog you and propel you to where you want to be. So it's not always, it's that balance of I enjoy it, I like it, it makes me money. But know that your every job is not your end all be all. All of us, or even if you're young, your first job is not going to be your final job. She's coming back. Stick with us. There I can we go. Hear you. Okay. Yeah, it froze up for a minute. You were on a okay. roll. Can't hear you. Did you hear me? No, nope. I said I heard you're on a roll. Yeah, that was what I said. That's okay. I said. So yeah, you were you were talking about um connecting. You know, your Venn diagram, what are you good at? What are you passionate at? What can you do to make money? Um, and you, you were explaining why. Why you love to dance? You're not going to quit your full-time job and go work. Oh, I got so many jokes for that. Um, and go work somewhere that that where people dance. Um, <laughs> the PG show. Uh, <laughs> so uh, so where with, with your skills, right? You were, you were putting together all your skills. You speak well. Let me let me. You are a good professional speaker because I hate when people say that. Um, you can write. What was the other thing you said? Um, connecting people or connecting to my community. Something else. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, how would you, how would you pair those together with an ideal career? So it also it depends on industry. So I'm interested in education, um, but if someone else you know was interested in another industry, it would it would make sense. But for me, the job that I have now, I get to travel and talk to people about education. So I public speak. I have to do a little bit of writing because I have to respond to RFPs. Um, I connect people in my both work life and my personal life. Right. I connect people around Philly to each other and to me. And then we go and support other people's things that they got going on. Um, and what was the last one? Uh, speaking, writing, connecting. I think those were the three that we talked about. So I, I but it would depend. Like if I wasn't passionate about education and I work for an education tech, tech company, if I was to pair those skills and be a. Like those might lead me to be a hairstylist. Those might lead, lead me to be a mechanic. Those might or be a trainer or a teacher. Those same skills like underline you have your what you call your soft skills or your transferable skills. And those are the fundamental things, communication, leadership, um, relatability, like those sorts of things you can take in any, in, in any industry. Right. Whether you're a mechanic, whether you're a doctor, you still have to talk to people, consult with them and say, hey, what do you need? What's your problem? You listen. You figure out what the solution is. So a doctor and the mechanic are using the same skills. Right. But they both have to know that they're good at that or parse that out at some point, too. So it can, it can work for any industry. OK. OK. So millennials have hope. Gen X people have hope and baby boomers have hope. There's room for everybody. Right. Yes. But you have to be able to make yourself palatable um, uh, enough via your resume or some other form of digital branding. Correct? Or no? Yeah. And your skill setting. 
I will, I'll, one more point on the millennial or the generation, not millennial, millennial Gen Z. I think we also now at this point, because of technology, maybe have an inflated sense of what success looks like or how we get there. Because I think for people who are younger than me, they've seen somebody do something on YouTube and now they're a millionaire, right? Like you, you they, Jay Versace, for example, right? His, his net worth is like 21 million or something at this point. And all, he's just making videos that are fun to him, right? So now you see him. Hey, He's, a, he's an influencer, <laughs> an influencer. So we've been able to see whereas in the past you had to work really hard. Look at Oprah, work really hard, have your own show, you know, to be famous. But now I could make, I could do something silly right here on my phone today and I could go viral and everybody could know my name tomorrow. And then I have a level of celebrity or fame that I did not have before. So I do think that sometimes the, but we don't necessarily see like the hard parts when people are grinding, when people are going to companies and pitching themselves, you know, no one shows that on IG. They don't show the work that they have to do to become an influencer. So I think sometimes people think that step A to, to Z is a straight line. All you got to do is do that, right? Like, but we don't see all in between. And so some of that in between might be taking a job you don't like. It might be working with people who you don't really want to work with. It might be the hard, like the grind that we always see right. on Instagram. There, that's a grind for everybody, no matter what. You don't get anything instantly, right? Some people, like even Issa Rae, she was making videos for 10 years before she got her HBO, and now she's making movies and doing all those things. But if she didn't start in 2006 or whatever doing those things, she wouldn't be where she is now. So it's really about kind of grinding it until you can get to where you want to be. Yeah, because Issa did what? The, the Awkward Black Girl? I think Miss Adventures of Awkward Black Girl. Right, and it's funny that she even now still... Uh, interweaves that series in um, Insecure. She yep. does a lot of the same thing. So you can tell she's migrating the skills that she learned um, from Weird Awkward Black Girl to now Insecure, which is on HBO. Right. Right. The yeah. glow up. She had to put yeah. in the work. Yeah, you got to put in the work. But, I, you know, I, I will say this. I do think a lot of times millennials or Gen Zs get um, a bad rep because some of us older folks look down on them and don't realize that to me, baby boomers are so millennials are a remix of baby boomers. Baby boomers did a lot of the same things millennials are doing right now. Mm-hmm. Baby boomers in the six, late 60s and 70s, they didn't want to go to work. Mm-hmm. They were about flower power. They were about living in compound. Some of them, right? We're talking generally, right? But they did all these quote unquote anti establishment things. Everything from uh, boycott the war to have these weird uh, festivals and drugs and orgies and things like that. It seems like everybody forgets that. Mm-hmm. And now we have millennials and they say, well, they don't want to work uh, a regular job because there's more to this. There's more to life than just working. I would think, especially baby boomers, they would get that more, but it seems like they don't. Mm-hmm. You know, I guess. Um, a lot of times we forget the past until it comes up and smacks us in the face. Right. Um, so everybody has skills. Uh, everybody can highlight those skills. And then you also talked about figuring out where you wanted to work potentially, right? As you said, you know, go to family and friends first, look at your, your LinkedIn. What if a person actually has no clue and they're just looking for a job just for, just for the money? What mm-hmm. do you think they should do? So if you don't have people who are who can connect you to kind of where you want to be, you just want to find a job. I mean, I would start with Google. So what do you I mean, of course, there's the websites monster.com, indeed.com, you know, uh, all sorts of like job search websites. So Glassdoor, you can find jobs through there. So I would just, you know, start with one of those general jobs if you just kind of want to scroll through jobs. But if you know, OK, I want to be a cleaner, I can Google cleaning companies, Philadelphia. I can go to their website. When I go to their website, I'm looking for a tab that says about or leadership or our team or join us. You know, those are the kind of keywords. And usually on any website that's hiring, at least you scroll down to the bottom, you'll see a career section or they'll say join our team. And that's where you can kind of figure out, okay, here's where I submit the application. Or you go to their, their, our team page and you find out the names of the the president, the names of the founder, the names of the people in whatever industry you want to work in. And then you go to LinkedIn, you type that person's name in there, and now you message them and say, hey, I'm looking for this. You know, would you be willing to chat with me for 20 minutes? Or, hey, are you all still hiring? I know it's coronavirus. You know, now it's a good time because people are at home. People may be perceived 
to have a little bit more time. Now is the time to reach out and say, hey, can I just talk to you for 15 minutes on Zoom really quickly? Like you, there are ways that I think you can use the job search services that are online. There's apps also, all kinds of job search apps. Make sure that you have a, an updated resume. Make sure that your search terms on there are correct so that you're receiving alerts every day when new jobs pop up. All those sorts of things are going to help the person who maybe doesn't already have those connections to start building them or just to start applying. If you want to just shoot out resumes, go ahead. But I don't think that's the smartest way to job search. Gotcha. Now, you're, you're recommending doing a cold email or a cold inbox message on LinkedIn. Is there a certain etiquette you should follow um, when doing that? Yeah. So there are templates available. If you even Google how to ask for an informational informational interview, you can find like actual word for word, dear such and such. But you always want to, of course, find out what that person's title is. You know, greet them. You want to make sure you're you're speaking in your professional tone in your emails. But you're really saying, hi, here's who I am. Here's why I want to connect with you. Here's when and how long. Or you want to make a very clear ask for availability. You can say, hey, I'm free Thursdays from 12 to 5. Please let me know if you have an upcoming Thursday when you're free. Right? You want to make sure that you're asking for the least amount of effort possible. Or you can say, hey, here are three times. Do any of these three times work for you? You don't want to get stuck in like, hey, can I talk to you? And then they have to respond, yes. And then you have to respond, when are you free? Then they have to respond with availability. Like, no, make one message and put all of the critical key, all the things they would want to know. Think about if somebody, if you got a random email, what do you want to know? Who's sending me this email? Why? What do they want? Okay, I can respond. And you can right. you, you can have two exchanges that set up a whole meeting, right? And then you just then what I would do is follow up after, send them a calendar invite. That's the advance, that's the 2.0 of it. Go on your Google, create a calendar event and send it to them. So now you and them know how you're gonna contact. If you're gonna be on Zoom, put the Zoom link in the in the calendar invite. If you're going to be on Hangouts, Google Calendar will actually allow you to set up video conferencing within your invite. So all they have to do is click join hangouts and they can join it. The other thing I do just to, to cut down confusion, if I have the person's phone number, I will say Jasmine to call Bobby B at this number. So that way, if that's the wrong number or if he thought he was supposed to call me, now it's both clear. We both have the same information in the calendar invite because there have definitely been times when it's like, okay, Kamari, let's talk at five. Okay, five o'clock comes. Well, I don't know if I was supposed to call him, if he was supposed to call me. I don't know, you know, now you're both waiting. <laughs> And they're thinking you're late. And here it is, 5, 10. Neither of you have called each other. So that way, everything is clear and simple. So follow up with the calendar invite the day before. Hey, look forward to talking to you tomorrow, to tomorrow at 5.30. Please let me know if anything changes. Right? So you want to be sure that your follow-up and being thorough is what is going to capture people's attention. If you make it as easy as possible for them and they know that you're on your stuff, and then afterwards, of course, you can send them a thank you email or a thank you gift card if you can or whatever, something nice. Like, hey, you know, or offer to do something for them. They're going to want to connect you with their connects. They're going to want to talk to you the next time you want to talk. Right. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Uh, one more question. Mm -hmm. Internships are working for free. Do you, especially for those who are looking to switch careers or those who are looking to gain experience? I know there's been a lot of pushback on that lately. What do you think about that? Okay, so there are so in terms of internships, there are paid internships and there are also unpaid internships. There are also apprenticeships. I think that if I want a job, let's say I'm right here, the job I want is over here. If I don't have the skill set to get me across this bridge, then the next thing I can do is go and volunteer somewhere or I can find an internship or find someone to mentor me that's going to help me get to where I want to be. So the what I think internships are able are helpful ways to help you transition industries to help you build skills and maybe you just do it on the side if you have a full-time job okay you'll say hey i'll come volunteer or, or give me an internship and pay me ten dollars an hour and i'll do something on saturdays from nine to twelve now the what reason about, why that what about free or for free if you are dedicated and you want to change your position in life you will work for free you have to if you can't get there in any other way Work for free because it's giving you experience that you can put on your resume. Because some jobs, you know, there, there's always this conundrum of they want you to have experience before you get that job to get more experience. Well, right. internships, volunteering, working for free are ways to get that experience. So now you have something else to put on your resume, but you're also able to build connections. So while you're working there Saturdays from 9 a.m. to 12, you might meet people who can get you a job in the area that you want. You might right. that owner of, or manager, whoever is working with you, can connect you to somebody else. So it's really good, even though, of course, none of us love working for free. And I will talk about in a second the boundary to that. 
Working for free can get you additional skills, can get you experiences, can get you connections that can get you where you wanna be. Now on the other side of that, as you know, black and brown people have been exploited in this country for years. So you want to, not to get super political, but you wanna also say, okay, I'm gonna work for free for you for six months or for eight weeks, or here's the time that you, go ahead, you wanna, you wanna, you wanna jump in? No, I was gonna say, this is the Finance Rebel Show. I don't mind getting political. This is about okay. getting free. So <laughs> okay. we, okay. we need to add that, that lens in that context, I'm with it. Well, listen, it's important because sometimes, depending on who you're working with and what your relationship is, they'll be like, oh, free labor? For sure, we in there, right? And now they're, you're working for them for years for free, beyond the point where you have gained the experience, skills, and connections that you wanted. So you wanna make sure you're not letting someone exploit you, or you might start out for free, but say, okay, the second six months, can I get $10 an hour? Can I have $20? Can I work on projects in addition to this that will get me more money? So you want to make sure you're setting boundaries and advocating yourself and making sure that whatever arrangement you have between yourself and the person who you are working with for free, know that there's uh, there's limits to that. Or here's what I will do for free. But after these three things, you have to pay me for Like stand up and advocate for making your own money. Right, right, right. Makes perfect sense. Makes perfect sense. Um, a lot of times I get pushed back because I believe in free, obviously, mm -hmm. strategically, obviously with boundaries. Um, I went to college kind of late, um, but when I came out, I wanted to transition into financial advising. I, I was a single parent um, and I had bills, but I went to work for free um, at Lincoln Financial Advisor. So I used it to my benefit. It was hard work. It wasn't easy, but, you know, I used it as a stepping stone. And so mm -hmm. I, tell, I tell a lot of people, I said, you know, even to this day, I still do free things that bring me a whole lot of value because it's really more of a mutual exchange. I'm exchanging my talent, time or treasure with said person or organization. And usually I get more relationships out of it, relationships that I might have not met, you know, just on a regular clear day when I'm walking around downtown somewhere, you right. know, I was able to put myself in position to meet other people, which then in turns put you in position to do other things or get other jobs or other business opportunities. So, you know, I, I tell people that all the time. You got to do it. You got to do it right, though. You got to be very strategic about it. Right. So I don't want to take up all your Saturday. Um, but we got it looks like we have a couple of questions. Um, so I just want to take a couple of minutes and get to them. Okay. Does anybody really look at pages or the email attachment? If that is the case, why do pages mean anything? We're going back to the resume question and about resume length. Sure. So in terms of the ways that you email your resume, I would always, first of all, just say it should be a PDF and don't send people Word documents because formatting can mess up. So if you send somebody a PDF, pages matter because people aren't going to scroll and hunt to find your information. Think about what's going to, if a recruiter is looking and they have 10 seconds, what's going to attract them? What's going to put you in the best light? But um, again, for academics, pages, you can have as many pages as you want. It's a whole different thing. It's called a CV, whole different than a resume. Resume should be, again, one or two pages, capture their attention, make them want to talk to you more. So pages matter because people aren't going to hunt to give you a job. Okay. Great, great. And by the way, if you're just joining, I'm Kamari Ellis. This is the Finance Rebel. We have Jasmine Omar. Rugby, right? Did I get it right this time? Omarok Bay. Omarok Bay. All right, yeah. Omarok Bay. Um, she is an expert in job placement, resume writing, and career coaching. And so I had her come on today to just help out our audience with those things. If you know anybody that's looking for a job, share this video with them so they can check it out. Jasmine's already dropped a lot of jewels already. All righty. Alea, right? I think Aaliyah. I got her Aaliyah. 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 What if you don't feel like you have enough to put on a resume? Should you add some stuff uh, that you may be that you may be older but still res relevant? So I'm guess she's saying that may be older, but it's still relevant. Yeah, I would I would definitely. If you don't have enough, try to fill, of course, one page at least. And there are things that you can do, like adding qualifications, adding skills. There are resume fillers that we could recommend, and I'm happy to work with people on. But if you you can add older things that are still relevant. What's key is relevance, right? Don't add older stuff that doesn't matter. Add older stuff that's relevant uh, to your resume. And that's totally fine. So let's, I'm going to use me for an example. I used to be what's called a Microsoft certified engineer years ago in the tech industry. I haven't done that in years. 
But if I wanted to go back and say apply for a tech job, I, I should listen, listen, right? Yeah. Just to show that. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you. Hello to you as well, Edith. Yes, I am the uh, Black Boost Perf today. We're going to work that out. That's actually kind of a catchy name, though. But I guess maybe I might be Papa Smurf because he had the beard. He was the only one that had a beard. But uh, Imani B says, I work in higher education with traditional college age students. Any suggestions specific to their population, especially if they don't have vast experience? I feel like we kind of covered that. But yeah. if there's something else you want to add, no, I think it's the same things. I will say being in college, they have the extra bonus because most colleges have a career center that folks can use all throughout their college career. And then some even up to one or two years after that. So even as an alumni, you know, you can go back and say, hey, can I use the career services? And they can maybe look over your resume. A lot of the career centers have websites where they have like formatting or tips. They have lists of action verbs that you can use. So make sure that specifically for college age students, in, a different, in addition to everything else we discussed, to make sure that they utilize their resources. And also when you're in college, people are more willing to do those informational interviews. So they're like, oh, you're young, you're coming up. Sure, I'm gonna help somebody come, you know, try to give who out how I was. So, right, those are, that's a great space to be in to say, hey, I'm at, I'm in college at Penn. I really wanna be a doctor. You're a doctor, can you talk to me? And people will probably more be more willing even to talk to college age students. Right, and I wanna add on to that. One of the things I noticed when I was in college, I was older than everybody else. I was like, literally the old man there. But I found that many of the students did not apply for internships. Mm -hmm. And I was always, that always boggled my mind. They didn't apply for internships, at least not at the level that I felt that they should. And many of them didn't apply for the travel abroad opportunities, which I think can help uh, immensely when you're doing your career search as well. So, you know, those are the two things I always tell college students, but anytime I go back and do mentor sessions uh, at Temple University. Shout out to Temple University, the greatest college in America. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. Hey, you in Philly, so you got to buy by Philly rules now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so Edith says, I believe our years of hustle are our pers pers are our personal universities of learning. Okay. I can see that. Trial and error, creating wisdom and discernment to achieve the ultimate goal. For example, I attend the Edith University. Mm -hmm. All right, I like that. I like that. I mean, again, I, I believe in lifelong learning. I don't, I don't believe that learning stops when you leave school. Um, I'm not going to get into the whole college versus not going to college now, but I think formal or informal, we should all be lifelong learners. Right. For a bill, okay, so now this is about doing um, uh, informal uh, interviews or interviews. For availability, what are your thoughts regarding telling people they can look at your Google calendar for time to schedule a meeting? Mm -hmm. I thought about that. I wasn't thinking about Google, but what do you think about that? So I think it depends on the purpose of the interview or and or your status. When you make the big bucks and you want to tell somebody like, oh yeah, look at my calendar. I prefer the method of, hey, I'm emailing you. Here are three times when I'm available. Do any of these work for you? I would say when I talked about minimizing the hassle or the inconvenience for the person that you're asking for something from, I think it can come off either a little bit pretentious or maybe not as efficient to say, hey, go look at my Google calendar and see when when you can meet with me. Right. Like, no, you're asking them for a favor. You're asking them for your time. I would give the windows that you're available or and always give the caveat. Well, if none of these times work for you. Let me know when's best and I'll make it work. Like, you know, you, right. you share your availability, cut out the middle step of them having to go find your calendar, look at it, compare it with theirs, tell them when you're free and then, or say, you know, if you can provide me with three times you're free, I'll make one of those work. And you just commit right. to update your schedule based on that. But I say minimize the hassle or inconvenience when you're asking someone for a favor. Don't make it hard for people to help you. Right, right, right. I mean, I agree. I tell my clients, I have a, a no friction rule. So I try to reduce all friction when it comes to getting payments, especially, but even when it comes to setting appointments. So sometimes having like tools like Calendly and some of the others or Google, they work. But if you're sending, if you're asking somebody for something, it doesn't make sense, in my opinion, to have them take an extra step. Because I know when people ask me for stuff, 
and they start adding all these extra steps, I totally check out because then I'm thinking about all the other stuff I have to do. Right. So, you know, try to put yourself in the mind space of the person that you're asking of this interview or a special favor from for. Uh, Edith Richards says, well, I doubt that Kamari is my mentor. I didn't know that, Edith. You know what? I saw you say that somewhere else. We might have discussed terms and negotiate that or something. No, but I'm honored, Edith. Thank you so much. And Imani says, yes, this is so good. Thanks for all the gems. Well, thank you uh, for joining us, Imani. Pleasure to virtually meet you. Um, Jasmine, in closing, where can people find you? How can we support you? Um, you know, what do you have going on? Where would you like us to either help or direct us to get to know you better? Sure. So again, thank you for having me on today. I am launching a website this week and I had a different one, but I took it down. So it's going to be jasmineomo.com. So if you look this evening, I have a live already with my friend. We're doing kind of a podcast live video tonight. And after that, jasmineomo.com will be up. Um, I'm on Instagram at j.sheree, C-H-E-R-I-E underscore Amour, A-M-O-U-R. So Sheree Amour, like Stevie Wonder song. Um, I'm also on Facebook as Jazz. Jasmine Omarogbe, my first name and last name as well. But the website is jasmineomo.com. But you won't be able to find it yet because like, the launch is tonight after the podcast. Yeah, but you know, this video goes up. Who knows when somebody's going to watch it? Oh, true. And so, Thank you. you know, I'll be, I'll be ready, right? Jasmineomo.com. Yep. Yep. And can I, Kamari, too, I know that the video was titled Three Ways to Elevate Your Job Search. So just really quickly to make sure that people got those three ways. Number one is to refresh your materials. Number two is to refresh your job search strategy. And number three is to refresh and refine your skills. Go out there and learn what you need to do to get the jobs that you want. Okay. So give them to me again. Re refresh your job search strategy. No, but that's number one. Number two. But number one is refresh your materials. Refresh your materials. So materials resume being cover resume, cover letter, and digital assets, right? Yep. See, I was listening. You were. Thank goodness. All right. And so the number two is refresh your job search. Strategy. Strategy. Refresh your job search strategy. Okay. Yep. So include informational interviews. Think about what positions are going to be stepping stones to get you where you need to get. Think about relocating. Think about, you know, all those sorts of things. Think differently about how you're thinking about your job search. It's not point A to point Z. It might be all in between. And then the last one is to refresh and refine your skill set. Figure out what you don't know. What are the gaps in your learning and how can you fill those through volunteering or free or unpaid internships, through online courses, through mentorship, through informational interviews as well. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anything else you would like to leave us with, Jasmine, before we go? Uh, no, I appreciate everyone's time. Of course, my website, I'll have private consultations. If you want to schedule 30 minutes to talk with me, if you want me to look at your resume, um, I will have those paid services. So I'm happy to stay connected with anyone who's watching this um, and happy to just answer questions via DM as well. Thank you, Kamari, okay. for having me. No, thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone, for watching. I see there are a couple other uh, questions out there. Um, no, they're not. They're, they're just thank yous. Thank yous. Okay. okay. All right, everybody. Thank you. Carice, thank you. Um, and everyone have a great day. Listen, let's make this time very productive. Let's be very, very intentional. I get it. It can be very uh, downing, very depressing because we don't have great leadership right now. But guess what? We could all be great leaders of ourselves. So let's be very intentional about these steps we take over these next several days, weeks and months, because these next several days, weeks and months will change how your next years and decades will become for your life. All right, everybody, have a great Saturday. Again, I'll be back Wednesday, Wednesday, 8 o'clock, YouTube, Facebook, IG. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye.